Welcome to episode 50 of the Food Grads podcast, the podcast where we explore careers in the food, beverage, and agricultural industries. I'm your host, Veronica Hislop, a PhD candidate in molecular science and career partner with Food Grads. This week on the podcast, I have our first ever returning guest and hopefully the start of many more to come. Of course, our first returning guest is Nicole Galacci. Nicole Galacci is a talent solutions manager focused in the food and beverage industry. After 10 years of third-party recruiting in the industry, she noticed a gap with regards to support for students and graduates looking to start their career. She also saw the need to attract people into the sector. She started Food Grads in 2016 and is a key partner of Food and Beverage Ontario's Taste Your Future and Careers Now programs. Nicole sold Food Grads in 2021 to the Town Solutions Group who own Careers in Food, AgCareers.com, and DeLacy North America. She continues to grow food grads, supporting students and grads, as well as increasing relationships with colleges and universities, and has gone back to her roots, partnering with organizations as a third-party recruiter to support their hiring needs. On this week's episode, Nicole and I caught up with each other since the last time we recorded, which was two years ago back with episode one. We talked about food grads' connection with the careers and food family and other partners of food grads. Unlike episode one, I actually got to focus more on Nicole and what she actually does as a recruiter because it's funnily enough something I've never actually asked her despite working alongside her. Nicole gives some firsthand insights on what recruiters look for in candidates even if you are not looking for a job. It was a really interesting thing to learn more about and if you recruiters are pretty big in the industry so I do suggest that you listen for this episode. We rounded this episode out by talking about what's next for food grads. And let me just say there is going to be a lot of exciting stuff coming your way starting in September. So for students and new graduates, keep your eyes peeled because food grads is working hard to help create resources and opportunities to help you in your careers. So enough with that introduction. Let's get on with the show. So I have a very special guest on with me today, and you might recognize her name from Food Grads, obviously. And if you listen to our very first podcast episode, we have a recurring guest here, our first ever guest that's come back. And it was two years ago that we did our first podcast recording. And for our special, I wanted to bring Nicole back on for episode 50. So pretty big milestone right here. (laughs) Thank you. Hello again. (laughs) For those who might not know who Nicole is, so Nicole is the founder of Food Grads and has brought it to where it is today. And I wanted to come back and talk with Nicole um, to see how things have progressed in just two years because so much has happened since we did our first podcast. And there's a lot we didn't talk about. So this Mm -hmm. is our part two and we're going to we're going to get into it. Yes, been lots of changes since our, lots of changes since we started Food Grads, lots of changes in the last two years since we started the podcast. Yeah, okay. happy to chat. <laughs> so for, before we get into maybe talking about Food Grads, where it's at, and I hope most people know who you are, but maybe give a, yeah. give a background on what you're up to with Food Grads right now and where that's at. Yeah. So yeah, Nicole, I'm the founder of Food Grads. We started Food Grads back in 2016. Prior to that, and I know we're going to touch on this a little bit more, I recruited in the industry for almost 10 years and noticed a gap that there weren't enough young people exploring career paths in the food and beverage industry. I was calling upon the same sort of cohort of of people early in their career, and that that number wasn't increasing. It was kind of like the same people I would be reaching out to. So that was really curious to see why we weren't seeing that pipeline constantly being filled. Because while I would interview people in my day job as a recruiter, time and time again, I would hear, I love this industry. I'm not going anywhere else. But when we dig back into their resume and talk about their career progression, it was always interesting. I felt that a lot of the time people didn't intend to work in the food industry, food and beverage processing. They zigged and they zagged and they ended up in food. But it's such an amazing industry, predominantly recession proof. It doesn't go anywhere in, in tough times like we've just seen with, with COVID. The need for people just increases. I thought that was really interesting. So started Food Reds in 2016. It initially started as a place to share 
conversation, a, a blog, and then progressed into a place where employers can post their jobs. And I definitely, before the time that I actually sold food grads to Careers in Food and Talent Solutions Group over there, started to work more with educators in the space. Lots happened and I can mm-hmm. go through that, but yeah, there's been a lot of changes as it's evolved. I also work a lot with, during the time with, since 2016, so in 2017, started working with um, Isabel Doctor and the, <coughs> excuse me, Food and Beverage Ontario team with the Taste Your Future program and then in 2020, the Careers Now program. So lots to talk about and unpack, but yeah, here we are today. I sit with the Talent Solutions Group with Careers in Food, Ag Careers, the Lacey Executive, and now two grads. Wow, that's pretty exciting stuff. It's really nice to see how within the past like few years, like there's really has been these changes and there's been a lot of more collaboration And really like a lot of forces coming together with all these like really good minds to really bring awareness to it that just wasn't really there when even I started thinking about going into the industry, which is pretty cool. Yeah, it's, I think that was one of the missing pieces was a lot of the different groups, different associations and companies were working quite siloed and Mm -hmm. um, to really move the needle and make an impact, which is what the food and beverage processing sector truly needs. I feel like we need to work together. Like the only way we can really do anything is when we do things together. And so there's so many really amazing groups of of people working hard in the sector, but I felt like I really, I still do, there's still work to be done, but to bring these different groups together, to work together, to move the needle, to, to make an impact is, um, you know, is so important right now. Yeah. And I know you're part of that. So we're thrilled to have you doing what you're doing with the podcast and other areas of the business through careers now and through careers as well and, and careers in food. You know, we thank you for your contribution <laughs> over the years, for sure. Oh, thank you, Nicole. But um, so one of the things that you pointed out that I want to go a little bit more on is for some people looking out and coming in, they're like, okay, so here's food grads and here's careers in food and kind of what's going on there. And would you be able to talk more about like food grads now connection with careers in food and ag careers just so maybe uh, people get a better understanding of that? Yeah. Careers in food is, a, is basically the number one job board in North America. I found out very quickly when I started food grads and then after a couple of years, I did create a job board. A job board is a monster, like it's a beast in and of itself. It, lots of different associations, different groups will say, oh, we'll help our members or we'll help this, this particular group will provide a job board. And I would say mostly they will find that their job board will fail in the way that people won't find their job because it is the jobs that are posted. It is very challenging to go up against the major job boards. So I'm talking the Indeed, the Zip Recruiters, LinkedIn. There's so many massive global job boards out there. So to to compete and get those positions posted, it, it, get them posted and found is really challenging. So most of the time, companies can post jobs on these sm- smaller sort of job boards, but the impact won't be there. Companies won't be saying, oh, I'm getting tons of candidates applying. That's kind of in its simplest form. And Careers and Food has done an amazing job for years and years and years. They've been, you know, I think 20 years Careers and Food has been a job board. And since 2016, there's been a, a, an emphasis on growing the Careers in Food job board brand in Canada specifically. When I sold Food Grads to this Talent Solutions group, one of the things I was thrilled about was the fact that Food Grads no longer had to focus on a job board because and what I say had to, when I when I was doing what I was doing with Food Grads, attracting people into the industry, having conversations with students and grads and job seekers, ultimately sharing information and providing support and all the things that we were doing with Food Grads was one thing and it's definitely needed. But the question would be, now I'm ready. Now I want to find a job. Where are the jobs? Where do I find them? And I provided a job board, but in order to get momentum, that in itself was challenging and taking a lot of my time. So in 2020, when 2021, I should say, when um, when I sold two breads, actually 20, yeah, 2020, I was able to say, pass that piece of the puzzle over to Careers in Food, where they they already have this, this machine in 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 process sort of thing. The way that, to answer your question, the way that food grads and careers in food work together is food grads now focuses solely on attracting people to the industry. So 
we provide information, information around careers. We connect the people in the industry. It's a really a peer-to-peer platform. We're encouraging people to blog with us again, to share their thoughts. We have a really robust blogging platform. We have over 500 posts in there now, just over the last few years. And it's not just from one person, it's from the blogs come from people in the industry and just starting out, students, grads, really sharing, you know, their thoughts, sharing why they joined the industry, sharing some of the challenges. It's not all just the fluff, the good stuff, it's the challenges too. But ultimately what you'll find is the stream of passion and loving what they're doing. There's definitely a focus on food science and you've had a lot to do with that and encouraging people to share the truth and what's going on in the food industry. We're really focusing now on our social channels. And building a brand where people feel they can trust the people that are involved in the community, because they are people that are in programs at schools across North America, explaining why they chose to work in the food and beverage industry, what their plan is, once they graduate, how they plan to impact the industry. And so it's exciting. It's, it's people with a conscience that want to share why they are doing what they're doing. And it can be from the food science side packaging, they want to make an impact in with regards to environmental issues, food waste issues, nutrition, health. It could be from any area, but that's what we find. People that enter the industry, they have a bigger purpose and that's why they've decided to focus in the food industry. And then the connection with careers in food is that once they have decided, they can then find those jobs in the industry very easily. I hope that answers your question. And I should add that this evolving food grants now because of the initial <clears throat> excuse me, the additional resources that we have, we have some changes underway right now. We can talk about it a little bit later, but one of the things we we started and now plan to really hone in on is the education partners program. So initially it was like having schools have some skin in the game where they would share the programs, we would promote the programs. But when I was just focused on food grants, um, predominantly with a really small team, it was hard to get that off the ground. And now that we are a larger team, more resources, we've now crystallized what we can deliver to the education partners, to colleges and universities across North America, and really build out that program. And we're preparing to uh, launch that in the fall. Really excited about that. I think there's a huge gap. The feedback that I had when I was working with a, a relatively small number of schools that showed an interest in food beds right off the bat. They all came to me and said, if you guys do this and provided me a list. And at the time it was like, these are great ideas, but I can't execute on them at this time. And now I'm really excited that the answer is now, yes, I can execute on the ideas that were given to me. We're going to have a focus group, really give us some feedback, get the website exactly where it needs to be prior to the fall and then um, launch with a bang in the in the fall this of this year so yeah exciting times it's super exciting like all those types of things are the st- stuff that I know that you've always wanted for food grads and I gotta pop in and just say that I think that we gotta think of food grads as like fun like there's mm. that's the whole point of it it's to celebrate and have fun and learn more of this industry and just have students get involved have opportunities because I know that when you're going to school it can be really difficult to you know manage school try to find a job try to do extracurriculars that like relate to the food industry but like one thing that always stood out for me with food grads and one of the reasons I stuck around is because it's something you can do on your spare time and it's fun like blogging I feel like with how things have moved towards like videos right now but for me blogging has always just been an amazing opportunity to like condense your thoughts, get it out there, have fun while writing. And there are things that I was actually able to directly talk about on my like resume and like talk in an interview. And I was having fun doing it. So it just mm-hmm. sounds like with the growth of food grads, there's going to be so many opportunities to help more students and just create like this like cool community. <laughs> well, and a lot of people that when I would first reach out, I knew that they had a great story to share and they Initial response is, oh my gosh, I've never written, I'm not a writer. And that's the great thing about blog posts is then you're not, you don't have to be a writer. They're somebody's personal experience, somebody's personal thoughts. Exactly. And um, they're going to relate to somebody. And if you're having a struggle or a thought, you can guarantee there's lots of other people that are having a similar struggle or thought. And so you're going to resonate with somebody. And to your point about video, I mean, I do think it's obviously the king of content oh, yeah. right now. I agree. But I would argue that 
the written word, something in a blog, something written is never going away either because not everybody likes to be in videos. And so you're going to have some people that whilst they like watching them, they're still going to perhaps put themselves in a camp and say, well, I, I'm not really, I don't have the confidence, so I don't enjoy being on video. It's just not my thing. And so I think it's important to keep a variety of mediums out there, like we do this podcast, but also a blog and include videos and things. And that's certainly something we'll increase in, in, in time. But yeah, I think it's important to have a sprinkle of different ways people <laughs> yeah, receive information. Sure. And it's some of our most popular blog posts are the ones that were written by students or like just talking about stories. And I'm going to self-insert here. Mm. If we get involved with those who get involved with the blog, talk with me directly and I help them out and fix. I, I, I say fix it up, but honestly, I don't really have to most of the time because most people are just so good and like raw with what they're talking about that I think that's always the best thing anyways. So yeah, I think if you fix it too, too much um, and it doesn't sound like it's coming from somebody and obviously there's a place for editing and articles and things like that but I had to stop myself doing that um you and I both worked on on, on the blog page and I used to get my British hat and then try and change the grammar and things <laughs> like this and then I'd be like well, stop it because it's somebody's voice yeah and I think it's important to allow that voice to come through because how somebody someone's dialect how they speak when they write is going to resonate with a bunch of People, I have this conversation with my sister all the time because she used to be a lawyer and sister in England. And when she writes, she can be really formal. And I would say to her all the time, you know, you need to chill your conversation. So it's like a, a, a legal, I feel like I'm receiving a legal document when I receive a text message sometimes. But anyways, we all speak differently and write differently. And so it, I think it's important to allow that voice to come through in blog posts. Um, it makes them interesting. And then, of course, when you have a blog page like we have a few reds, it keeps it interesting because every blog is different if it comes from the same person all the time and that same voice then it can get a bit I think it will get it will eventually become boring yeah and you've been working on the blog for a long time now so you've seen we've had such a variety of different people and the feedback that we've had over the years I remember Sashana right from the get-go from Centennial and she was very nervous to write and then she was just like this powerhouse churning out blog after blog because she just realized she had so much to say and her blogs were getting read and she was getting all this wonderful feedback. And then she eventually got her first job from the sort of off that momentum. You know, it does work. I know you mentioned being able to speak to it in interviews and things. I think it's if you can go into an interview and your resume looks the same as 10 other grads, but then you could say, I'm really passionate about this industry. And here, here's a link to some of the, or putting it in your cover letter, here's a link to some of the blog posts I have written with food grads. And you can talk about some of the work you've done and some of the extracurricular stuff you've done. As a recruiter, I think that would definitely be something to set you apart from the group and really show the interview, the hiring manager, that you're serious and that you are interested in making an impact in the industry. And yeah, you're just starting out. Um, so you might be entering an entry level position, but if I'm sitting as a hiring manager, as a recruiter, I'm thinking this person's got some drive and some ambition mm -hmm. and, and it's going to stick around. It's not just a job because as much as I think yeah, entry level positions, if someone's kind of not sure if the industry is the right place for them, they may walk after six months a year if something better comes along. But as a hiring manager, I don't want to be refilling that role in six months. I want someone to join that actually has perhaps an intention to stay and grow with the company. And, and one of the things I know about this industry is that they do hire from within. That If you show that you have a commitment to the company, to the industry, you will be the person that when that the next step, that, that job opportunity uh, transpires, they will come to you and say, are you interested? And I can talk about this for an hour, but you know, <laughs> I've know. seen it time and time again. Companies do promote from within. They really, the food industry values loyalty and experience in the food industry so hands-on experience in the food industry so if you've shown that you're committed then you will be that person that keeps getting promoted mm -hmm. well one of the things that I wanted to bring you and talk to you about on the show because you, you mentioned it is recruiting and it's funny I've known you for a very long time now and I have never asked you what a recruiter really does. And to be honest, I've never really, like, I know that recruiters help companies like get jobs, but I've never mm -hmm. really known anything more about that. Like how you got into recruiting, how does it actually work? And I feel like you'd 
obviously would know some really valuable advice about what recruiters do look for because you are one. So Nicole, you have to tell me a little bit more about, <laughs> about this. Like, how did this happen? And what do you do? Yeah, I kind of fell into recruiting. I think sometimes your career definitely does find you. But I, it wasn't something that I planned to get into. I had a sociology background, HR background. Becoming a recruiter was something that I fell into for sure. And even the food industry, I remember when I first started out working with lots of different clients from tons of different industries. And we felt a little out of my depth when I would go into certain organizations, a steel company, for example, and they're talking about rebar and I'd have to like Google half the terms and it would really be a struggle. And so I felt like jack of all trades, the master of nothing. So I had a few companies in the food industry that I was working with. And I remember one of them was Kellogg, for example. And so this was like when I first started out and I was like, okay, I know what Kellogg's does. I cereal, I get this. And so it really became that simple at first, why I ended up in the food industry and recruitment. But then even more so, what I found with people in the food industry was that I really liked the people I was working with. So whether it was the, the CEO or the president of the company, the owner of the company, the VP of HR, the plant manager, I found that the people were really down to earth. And there was no airs and graces. It was just, we need to hire this person. And if you need any help, then let me know what you need from me. And really nice to work with. So I just found my, my niche. I found my group. And as for recruiting itself, it's really a people business. Some might argue it's sales because you do need to feel that you can reach out to companies. And certainly early on in your career, you are selling yourself as a recruiter. You're saying, I can find good people for you. But once you, it, it evolves, once you start to do a good job and you can bring great qualified candidates to your clients, less and less do you need to sell and more, more so your reputation and the results are there. And then you get repeat business from clients. That's certainly how it worked for me. And I found my niche and the food industry was it. Over years and years of working in the food and beverage industry, you get to, people get to know your name. And you just become somewhat of a subject matter expert. You learn. And I always get a little bit nervous with that term expert because you're always learning. And certainly in the food and beverage industry, it's evolved. Recruitment has evolved. But the industry, I look at it as two sort of sides of the, of the point. You're working in a recruitment is one thing and the industry is the other. And recruitment has changed. And when I first started out, LinkedIn was really new and people were using LinkedIn, but pretty cautiously. And now, of course, everybody's on LinkedIn and it's like the tool that most recruiters do use to build their network because essentially everybody's there. I think we try to move away from that a little bit because to rely on one thing is nerve wracking in a business. But the, rea the reality is it's, it's a great tool because everybody's there. Everybody's using it. And I think until things change, you have to rely on it to a certain degree because when students are at school they're being told to create a LinkedIn profile it's something that is just part of our culture now it's like social media and it is the professional platform so it's not going away so I think businesses need to learn to work with it I certainly use it but to ask your question about recruiters so essentially I always say get nervous when people are told to find a recruiter that they'll find you a job that's not what recruiters do recruiters work for their clients they work for companies and the way that it works is essentially a company will come to me and say, Nicole, I need a plant manager. And they will maybe work with um, their recruitment team, their internal recruitment team, and they may post the job. And then they're finding active candidates. I'm going to explain this in the most simple way I can. If you post a job, people that are looking for a job will maybe find it and they'll apply. And that is covering off the active candidate pool. What a recruiter does is perhaps posts it to so covers off the active pool but what they do is what we call direct recruiting i will essentially and i don't love the term but you're a headhunter you essentially go into the industry you look at what your client does and you find people in the industry that will be the perfect fit for your client so based on education based on experience you go into the industry and look for other companies that do something similar. And again, your company, your client will tell you the parameters. They're looking for a certain education. They're looking for certain years, work experience. Typically, it's a pretty robust list that they're looking for. They, they, I was looking for the unicorn. They want someone perfect. 
um, for their organization. Yeah, I mean, of course, they, of course. Uh, 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 yeah, this is what they want. And as a repeater, you you take that list of, of that wish list and you try and find the person or people and you try and put at least two or three, I used to say three to five superstars in front of your client. And so that I say used to because the times now because of COVID have changed the nature of recruitment and it's definitely changed the landscape. There is not, there are not as many job seekers right now, if there are, they're, they're hired like that. It, it's a very different climate. If I can get a couple of superstars in front of my clients, that's a win right now. And it's just the nature of things. And what we're finding now is typically in the past, if I had people in front of my clients to interview, they may only be looking at my client. Now they may have two or three options on their desk that they're looking at. So it's a very different environment. Right, right now I say to my clients, if you really like this person, you have to move faster because I guarantee they may have one or two other things that they're looking at and somebody else might get an offer in front of them. And it, it's just a very interesting time because of COVID. No one's ever really seen it like this. It's really strange. And in terms of even more so the entry level positions, a lot more companies are focusing now on new grads and have put a lot of emphasis on training, not only internal training to and skill development to retain their current workforce, but to take on people that have no experience and train them, have training programs in place that they didn't have before necessarily, certainly small and medium companies that didn't have before because they aren't finding the, that, that pool of individuals just doesn't, isn't there right now to, for a number of reasons. Okay. See, that makes more sense because I've heard the term recruiter like around obviously through you but just in general and it's just for so many people who are actively looking for careers sorry actively looking for roles like recruiter is not something that they would really think of so having someone who does come to you as a recruiter can be a little kind of a little scary to be honest with you mm -hmm. it's like why is this random person reaching like like yeah how do, how do I trust <laughs> them like how do I know yeah. like well, and I think it's important to, early on in your career, if you do get those calls from recruiters, listen to what they have to say. There may be one that you really gel with, that you like what they're saying. And I think it, it's good to make that connect with a recruiter and have that relationship. There are people that I've known now for over 10 years that I don't call by any means all the time because they're happy where they are. Maybe I place them in a company and I certainly wouldn't pull them in, in from the company that I place them, especially if they're a client. I would never pull somebody out that is a client of mine. But you just stay in touch and then they might come back to you after five years or three years and say, oh, I'm ready for that next step in my career. So that's why you would stay in touch with a recruiter. But I think the, the myth that they find you a job, especially when you're early in your career, is not accurate. And I think sometimes people can get disgruntled. Well, they didn't find me a job. That, you know, that's not actually, and it is because they haven't understood what a recruiter does. It's not actually what they do. And I think there are people out there that might promise to help you find a job. I would be a little wary of people that it's one thing to help you with your resume. It's one thing to coach you to find a job. But if anyone's guaranteeing that they'll find you a job, make sure you're fully exploring that. I don't know if there's many people that can guarantee that they'll find you a job. That's a big, that's a tall order mm -hmm. to say, I will definitely find you a job. And if they're taking money off you to do that, I would be very dubious. I don't want to say there aren't, haven't looked at that space, but I would be very dubious. I think, yes, there's coaching. Yes, there's resume support and all that kind of thing. Maybe interview support, how to help you with interview, all that sort of thing. Yes. But to guarantee to find you a job, I would be very dubious. See, that's really interesting because I didn't, I might be under that misconception too. Like just understanding what a recruiter does because it's, there's so many things it's that make up your role that for someone looking out and it's just, you know, especially if you're young in your career, just in life in general, like you just don't have these experiences working with others, no matter what the industry. Yeah. I hope that kind of it ever explains things. And I would also say that a lot of the time you'll find recruiters that specialize, they might specialize in a particular industry. You might have recruiters that specialize in a particular 
function like they only do engineering roles but there'll be there'll be a recruiter for engineers across different sectors so yeah the, you'll find recruiters there's, there's lots of them and uh to find a relationship with one would not hurt i think it's a good idea right now i work with an amazing team with the Lacey executive and we focus in agriculture and food and beverage manufacturing so again it's a niche and so within that though we'll place people in position i can speak for what i do so it can be Right across the board, quality assurance, operations, sales and marketing. I could get it if I need a HR person, right up to C-suite. I need a VP, I need a, a CEO. What we do is really focus on the industry. Become, we are industry experts. But one thing I want, so one thing I've noticed, at least even trying to reach out for those for the, the podcast, is just finding these people who are active online in terms of just knowing what their skill sets are. Like for a lot of production manufacturing jobs or maybe a production supervisor or something like that, like people aren't very social online, which understand mm-hmm. like they're focused on their career. And for those types of roles, maybe they don't need to particularly, you know, have a strong online presence, although I argue differently. But like how do you find the right person for these roles when, you know, they're not blogging about how, oh, I did this for, Mm. you know what I'm trying to get at? Yeah, yeah, no, it's a great question. It's interesting because years ago, I'm going to age myself here, when I first started recruitment, the way that we did, we reached out is literally reached into the company, we'd literally phone the companies and say, can I speak to your production manager? Or can I speak to your, one of your production supervisors? How effective that was remains to be. So that is it is debatable because it was really hard to reach people. And um, there's gatekeepers, you, the receptions would not put you through. And it was really challenging. So back then, before social media really took off and people were more present online, it really boiled down to relationships. You'd talk, you'd connect with somebody and you'd ask them, who do you know? Who, you, who do you work with? Who are your colleagues? And it wouldn't always be the case that they would tell you, but once they, you work with them and you develop those relationships, then they would, because ultimately we're not doing any harm asking the question. It's people who are nervous and they don't know you. And, and rightly so, people have their guard up if they don't know you. But once they get to know you and trust you and understand that you handle their candidacy very carefully, very confidentially and respectfully, that's how you grow in the industry as a recruiter. That's what's worked for me. When someone sends me their resume, you don't fly it around to different companies and you don't talk about the fact that they send you their resume with other people in the industry because it is a small industry and people know people. I say it's huge, but at the same time, it's really small. Everybody knows everybody. And, and so you manage things delicately and people trust you. So just recently I'm talking to somebody and they say, you know, I'm not interested in this role, but I do have a a colleague that might be because maybe they're not happy where they are or they're looking for a change or they're relocating. I mean, there's a million reasons why people move jobs. And so it really, you build your network. Your network as a recruiter is, is your lifeline. It's your bread and butter. You, without that network, without people recommending you to their colleagues and friends and family members and things like that, you really don't have those connections. It, and, you know, word of mouth, if you ask somebody, you know, looking for a uh, a production supervisor that's got bakery experience and you can maybe list some machinery that they might be working on or there's all these different things you'll be surprised once you have the name in the industry how many people will say i'll help you out because again it's a people it's your people working with people if you help somebody then they'll help you one day and it's no this isn't the right role for me nicole but i'll recommend somebody but if this comes along and across your desk, will you keep me in mind for that role? And it's like, absolutely. And so it's really a people business. I can't stress that enough. Relationship building is huge. And if you start burning bridges and only worrying about making placements, not really caring where you're placing that person, whether you've heard them and they've said, well, this is what I'm looking for, but you haven't been completely transparent and perhaps deep down, that's not the right role for them, but you push them to explore it and then push them into other people don't have their own minds you know it's amazing how influential recruiters can be and uh, if you're pushing them into a role that ultimately you know isn't what they're asking for isn't going to be the right fit you know maybe it's the, um, a management style that's not going to fit with them and they've told you that but you've chosen to ignore that because you can make the placement then you won't last long in, in the industry because sooner or later that does bite you in the butt 
and people won't trust you and won't work with you. You might not make that placement. And big, it's like having that big picture focus though for the for sometimes let the short-term gain go into the long term. And that's what's worked for me for so many years in this industry. And hopefully having a good reputation because of it, because I haven't burnt bridges and no, certainly not intentionally. I can't think of anything. You, you can't, you won't please everybody all the time. And I'm not saying you can, but if your intentions are always good and honorable and I always say I need to sleep at night. I yeah. can't do anything that my conscience wouldn't isn't good with. And again, you're dealing with people, so you have to treat them right. And um, and good things happen. I mean, recruitment is a great industry. It's a fun industry if you like working with people. There are ups and downs for sure. You think anything can happen. Your client can suddenly fill a role by themselves that you've been working on for three months. And typically, it's a con- you work on a contingency basis. You don't make any money then. You know, there's there's no money if it's contingency based and um, you've worked on it for months and it just got filled or they decided not to move forward with it and there's all these reasons why it mm-hmm. or you get to the point where your candidate's got an offer and the company is so excited to have them join and you're excited and everyone's excited and then your candidate turns to you and says I've taken the day to think about this and I've decided not to not to move forward because xyz or they do move forward, they hand in their notice and their current company gives them a counter offer, which they decide to accept. And there are so many variables and you can't always anticipate everything you try to, and you can't always anticipate every variable that can go wrong, but so many things can go wrong. And then even after they start, I've had situations where a month in, a candidate has called me and said, Nicole, I hate to do this, but I really like it here. But my wife just got relocated in a job and she's the main breadwinner and now I have to move with her and I have to resign so then I'm back filling then Mm -hmm. I'm I'm filling that role again so it's a very interesting fun up and down not for the weak of heart (laughs) type of profession one of the things that you brought up that I think is a really good point is just the idea of even when we put emphasis on putting on social media, having a clean profile, doing all those types Mm -hmm. of things of actively networking, which is of course a good thing to do, but it, you shouldn't forget like the, uh, the offline world too still exists in the sense that being a good person at work, like the little things that people notice, they might not explicitly remember every little thing that you do, but sometimes one little thing will stand out and that will transcend. So even if you're maybe in a role that you didn't like, or maybe the company isn't good, that person you never know might end up working with you sometime in the future. And they can act as that person to pass in conversation because I know that sometimes people will talk about someone, even if they're not close friends, maybe you've met multiple times, but somehow they'll still talk about you. And Mm -hmm. there's, and it's not good to like be a good person at work too yeah people notice and it's not even just being a good person having good skills just there's so many things that you might not even be conscious that you do but other Mm -hmm. people pick up on a hundred percent and you know I always say never burn bridges especially if you're in a particular industry and you're not going to leave it you really don't know when you will bump into that person again. And it could be in another company. You could make a move. All of a sudden, you could be applying to a new company and somebody that you used to work with works there. Or you could go to an industry event and you're sat next to somebody that you used to used to work with. And again, I'm not saying that the world isn't all rainbows and, and, and unicorns and butterflies. I mean, it is, it, stuff happens. But at the end of the day, never burn bridges. I always say that to people when you do leave companies as a recruiter you know the question I ask out what's your contract say with regards to notice period and if someone's I'm really sorry I'm gonna have to give at least three weeks I I definitely have to give my two but I really want to give them three because I'm in a situation right now where I've got this project and that project and they're concerned and I actually think oh my gosh that's really good that you care you're leaving that company but clearly you have a conscience and you want to leave on good terms you don't want to leave them in a rut so that's really commendable. And I'm proud to go to the new employer and say, you know, they their contract says two weeks, but they want to give three because they want to complete this project and train the incumbent and help as much as possible to hand things off. As the new company, I think they should be really excited to bring someone like that on board that cares so much. And 
was grateful for the opportunity that they had. And it's not a bad thing leaving an old employer or to move on to a new employer. And it could be for a, a number of reasons. I know that it goes around on, the, uh, on social people leave managers, bad managers. And yeah, that's one thing. But sometimes it's just a recruiter called and put a position in front of them that they couldn't say no to. It was the, whether it, the opportunity was so good, the location was better, the career advancement opportunities are there the money, but there could be so many different reasons. And it doesn't always mean that they're leaving a bad situation. That's not always the case. So it means that they, they don't want to leave on bad terms. And sometimes people return to the company as well because they can, because they left on such a good note. The company were gutted that the person was leaving because they were such a superstar. But you know what? Well, they in five years time, 10 years time, you never know what the future holds and they might be able to have them back and they're there with open arms saying, come back. We'd, we'd love to have you back sort of thing. It's never a good thing. You know, I would say to, especially to, to graduates, don't leave handing the notice and be like, see, I wouldn't want to be, yeah, you know, like don't leave under those. Don't go to your exit interview, ripping everyone to shreds. Obviously, if you're in a situation where you want to give honest feedback, companies can learn from honest feedback. I'm not saying that. But be mindful of what you're saying and doing. Is it true? Is it kind? Is it necessary? I always run those things through my mind. If it's necessary, if there's something going on that you really need to let that hiring manager, you know, the, the HR person that's doing the exit interview, should they know that? Then absolutely tell them. But is it, are you just venting? Ask yourself that question, I would always say, because, you know, you don't want to put bad vibes out there like I don't think <laughs> it's always good to have a friend that is not work related that you can off put any frustrations to or some, yeah. some trusted person because you don't want to do that work <laughs> yeah keep that on your social keep tell your mom tell your friend but maybe not put that out there because it will it will stay out there and you never know who will hear that feedback and, and again I can't emphasize enough I think companies do learn from productive constructive feedback I'm not saying that but I think there's a way to convey that as well, rather than that sort of venting. I, I don't think that's the way to go. Well, Nicole, we're coming to the end of the podcast, and I don't really know how that's possible because I swear we just started <laughs> like a minute or two ago. But <laughs> regardless, I asked you this question two years ago, and I'm going to ask it again. So maybe you can give some different advice. But <laughs> I always like to ask your guests, what piece of advice would you give to students who are looking to go into the food and beverage industry? I would say definitely join the food grads community. You simply have nothing to lose other than everything to gain. A community, advice, information, and network. Reaching out to people in the industry is so important when you're first starting out, making those connections, finding mentors that could potentially stay with you throughout your entire career. That would be my number one piece of advice. And um, just go forth. Don't think, I think I, I wrote this for a recent article for uh, the career guide for Red Careers, actually. My number one piece of advice would be don't think you have to have it all figured out. I work with people 10 years, 15 years into their career that don't have it all figured out. That still say, okay, I'm at this point, I want to change, but I'm not sure. And they'll ask me or they'll be asking their mentor. They'll be asking their family. People never have it all figured out. That's what I've figured out at this point in my career. So I think there's, when you first graduate, to, to have it all figured out. And I always say, maybe have the next three to five years somewhat thought through. But again, you don't have to have it all figured out, but maybe have a plan for what you want to be doing in the next three years. But yeah, I don't think you need to have it all figured out the long term. Everything changes so fast. And my goodness, look what we've all been through the last few years. <laughs> who, who would yes. have predicted that? <laughs> for sure. Yeah. That's really comforting advice, Nicole. And we always got to hear it because in school, you're always asked, what do you want to do when you graduate? When do you want to do this? It's, oh my gosh, I'm just trying to get through the week. I can't yeah. tell you about yeah. five years from now. <laughs> Too much pressure. And I think it, it takes away the fun of it. And life should be fun. Life should be enjoyable. You know, what you plan to do, it, it should all be enjoyable. There's always, I don't, the term makes me laugh, but there's a, there's a shit sandwich. It depends on the variety you want to eat. Like life isn't always perfect. I think it was Elizabeth Gilbert that wrote about that. And uh, it's just the variety you want to eat. It's yes. not always going to be perfect, but you will have fun. You will have challenges. And there will be times when, you know, it's not always great. You don't wake up every morning skipping. And no, I think that's normal. That life isn't meant to be like that every day. But 
the majority of the time you're meant to feel motivated and feel like you want to find your purpose and feel motivated. And I definitely think there's tons of opportunity to find that in the food and beverage industry. And the great thing too, is you can move around. So even if you start to think this is not quite what I thought it would be, that's okay. You, you know, you can pivot. There's other things you can do in the industry and still make an impact. Um, but you, you know, it hasn't been a waste. You've li- lived and learned that that's not the path that, that was meant for you. And you can pivot and there's lots to do. There's so much work to be done in the food and beverage industry. And yeah, I think that would probably be the the best advice today. <laughs> Ask me again in the week, I'll probably give you something else. <laughs> well, we love advice. We love advice. So I'm going to leave it there, even though I could, again, go on. Mm-hmm. Well, we're going to have to get you on for maybe another 50 episodes and we'll get back because I'm uh, this podcast isn't slowing down and I'm really happy to catch up with you. So thanks for coming on the show, Nicole. Absolutely love to be on the next one, the next 50th. And yeah, you enjoy this beautiful sunshine we're having. We're so grateful to have you on the team. You do a fantastic job as our Food Grads host and so many other things I can't even list, but thank you for having me. Having me.